Hello, my name is Roger Furman from the UK Association for Accessible Formats. Welcome to this webinar on the eve of World Braille Day. I should like to acknowledge and thank RNIB for generously sponsoring this event. Our title this month is A Passion for Braille, and it is highly appropriate that we have as our guest Matthew Horspool. Matthew has been Braille's subject lead of the UCAF uh, Braille groups since November 2020, a lifelong Braillist, and he has many aspects of working in Braille as we will discover. He, uh, he is also very much linked with the Braillist Foundation, and he will be telling us about that later on. And in his spare time, he uses Braille in as he is a singer in the choir at Coventry Cathedral. So we will be learning how Braille helps him in that respect. Matthew, a very warm welcome to you and thank you for finding the time to be with us today. Well, thank you, Roger. Uh, I've been UCAF Braille subject lead for uh, longer than this webinar series has been going on, and yet it's the first time I've done a webinar. So uh, it's uh, really good to be with you all today. Great. So, Matthew, rather than necessarily beginning at the beginning of your Braille journey, can we begin at the start of your, uh, your Braille journey as a professional in the field when you acquired your first job? Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so it came about by accident, would you believe? Um, I went to a school for the blind and uh, then I went to a college for the blind. And by the time I'd got to university, I had decided that I'd had quite enough of blind people. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to be normal for a bit. Um, <laughs> bear in mind, I was only about 19 at the time. And that was, you know, that was just a, a sort of teenage you know, rebellion reaction, I suppose. But anyway, I went off to Coventry University and uh, and I was going to be normal and the blind community was going to be left behind. Anyway, very quickly, I realized I was on a fool's errand uh, because there were things that I needed um, as a blind person at university that I just didn't have, um, like Braille, actually, and uh, not so much Braille because I had a Braille display and I could sort of, you know, get through the bits that needed Braille. But I was studying computer science and I needed access to uh, tactile diagrams for things like uh, logic and sets and for uh, something called UML, which is a design language and all of this. And uh, I also needed mobility lessons. And there was a problem with mobility uh, lessons. Uh, they, they'd been sort of allocated to the wrong company and all this sort of thing. And so I did some homework. And to cut a long story short, the person who ended up coming out to do my mobility training uh, was working part time for guide dogs and part time for Exel Grange School. And when we ran out of lessons, we struck a deal where I could come in and use their Minolta machine, their, their swell paper diagram machine, um, in exchange for some volunteering. They needed somebody who knew Braille maths to help out around the school a bit. And uh, that volunteering then turned into my first job. Uh, the people who I was supporting in primary school moved to secondary school. The, the workload had obviously increased. They realized they didn't have the capacity, the teachers didn't have the capacity to transcribe the work into Braille themselves. And they needed to uh, employ a reprographics technician basically to do that. And, and I was looking for a job. And, uh, and so it all just sort of happened from there really. I went in to interview, not really expecting to get it, and then was told that I got it about half an hour afterwards. Fantastic. So that was an interesting journey. Can, can, can you just step back now to the beginning of your Braille journey and just tell us about how you found Braille through the learning process, through education, and as you've already spoken about university, but perhaps the earlier part of your of your journey with Braille. Yeah, well, Braille found me. Um, like I say, I went to a school for the blind and I've always been blind and uh, I really do think that's an advantage sometimes. I mean, look, blindness is a horrendous inconvenience. I think we'd all rather not have it. But um, I do think that being blind since birth was very helpful because, first of all, there was no getting away from the fact that I was blind. You know, it's not like I had a bit of sight and we could try and put that to use. But, oh, wait, that didn't really work. Yeah, no, I, I was blind, full stop. 
and also being blind since birth it could be dealt with from a very very young age so yes uh, all the way from nursery um i was at a school for the blind um was priestly smith in birmingham and um yeah i mean in nursery they said look you know we'll introduce you to your name in braille and i didn't know what braille was and i didn't really know anything really back then but um it, it introduced that concept of braille from a very early age and also uh, looking back on it a lot of concepts uh, that led up to braille so i got to play a lot with play-doh and i got to um play with lego and duplo you know and um things of that nature uh threading beads and you know following the string and finding what was on the end of it and i learned basic vocabulary like you know circle and square and triangle and uh, you know followed uh, all of that through so then by the time i got to infant school and everybody else was was learning handwriting i was learning braille at the same time uh, you know just just while everybody else was learning handwriting i was learning braille and it was just normal that i would have braille and i had one to one braille lessons once a week and we learned a new letter and then we learned what the letter stood for so you know but can and do uh, and so on and then we learned all the contractions and sort of just gradually built it up until i was probably about seven or eight i think once i'd learned most of the contractions there were the odd ones you know deceive perceive uh, that that i didn't learn simply because i hadn't come across that you know, I didn't know words that long, let alone contractions that long. But yes, basically, by the time I was about eight years old, I'd learned all of the grade two system as much as I needed to at that point. And you've, as I say, in earlier in this conversation, you've spoken about your use of Braille and your various ranges of things at university. When you got past uh, you you know you moved into the the phase at university when you realised you needed all these things. How did how did the uh, the use of diagrams, for instance, how, were you used to using diagrams by that stage, or was this a new concept uh, for you? Yeah, yeah, diagrams weren't new. Um, as I say, I was taught through Braille as my primary medium, so I'd learnt Braille. But yes, I mean I also learnt how to read graphs, you know bar charts, line graphs, um, how to make graphs using boards and pins and elastic bands and tactile graph paper, you know, all of that sort of thing. Mm. This wasn't new. Um, in geography, I'd learned about maps. I didn't particularly like maps, but I'd learned about them. And in science, there were various diagrams that we had to do for, for biology and for physics, you know, um, circuit diagrams, um, electron shell diagrams in chemistry. So all of this was fairly well understood that you could have tactile diagrams. And indeed, I'd learned the difference between a thermoform diagram and a Minolta diagram and how much better thermoform diagrams were, but also how much longer they took to make. Um, I think what was different going into university was that up until then, I went straight from Priestley Smith to RNC in Hereford and everything that I needed was provided. So by the time I got to university, I just kind of expected that everybody else would have the right answer. And when I got to university, they didn't. And although I knew about tactile diagrams and I'd used them all the way through school, it was quite easy, I suppose, not least because at RNC I was studying uh, computer based subjects anyway. So we didn't have an awful lot of Braille at Hereford. Um, so it was very easy for me to compartmentalize it all and to say, well, Braille's something you have in school and tactile diagrams are ha something you have in school. And now you're in the real world. You you don't have Braille anymore. And that, I definitely went through a period of that and, and had to go through a period of readjustment and realizing that actually, no, Braille isn't just for school. Braille is for everywhere and would be extremely useful. Braille is for life, isn't it? Oh, yeah, very much so. And I mean, yeah. in my adult life, I wouldn't be without it. No, no. Could you tell us now, because you are obviously very actively involved in the Braillist Foundation, so could you tell us about the foundation and your role in it? Yep, so the Braillists um, came about by accident um, <laughs> about the same time as I'd started at Exxon, actually. Uh, it was in 2014. Um, the, the mission of the Braillists now is more Braille, which I think is just wonderful because it just sums up how we all feel. Uh, mm. Back then, it was prototyping the Canute from Bristol Braille Technology. And the Canute was the first inkling that I had had as a young sort of Braille reader, but also young professional in the field that multi-line Braille might be on the horizon. And 
um, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if Exel Grange was at the cutting edge of this, you know, and, and I, I look, I wanted to go and see the Canute, but also in the back of my mind was the thought that if I can, you know, if I can really put Exel on the map, then maybe I'll get a pay rise and, you know, promotion and all this sort of thing. So I was very <laughs> eagerly going down to Bristol, um, you know, and, 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 and got back at a silly time of night as well, but went down to see uh, the first Canute and got introduced yes. to all these people. Yeah. And, and we were all just sort of passionately, talking about the Canute, obviously, but also talking about Braille and how we used it. And uh, I think this was technically the second meeting. There'd been a meeting previous that I hadn't been to. Um, but out of that came a realisation that actually we all want the same thing. And actually what that is, is to talk more about Braille. Um, and so it became apparent that perhaps we should set up a, an association to talk about Braille. Um, not so much i mean we, we had the braille authority and the braille authority obviously became ucaf and ucaf does great work and and we're certainly not in competition with ucaf i think um ucaf has its specialism in setting standards and that is really really important and really valuable work and it's not really where the brailleists is at the brailleists is at um teaching braille promoting braille talking about braille trying to figure out what the future of braille is uh, and so we really thought that you know an association like that would be useful and after a lot of hard work got it registered as a charity and uh, we had to decide who was going to be on the board of trustees and uh, I, I got invited to be on the inaugural board of trustees and um, from there it sort of went from strength to strength through the coronavirus pandemic running online sessions and things like that and then um, there came a point when it became clear that I was doing much more operational work than I was strategic and trustee work and so the decision was taken that I would come off the board and actually just be known for doing the the day to day work rather than the strategic work. And it is fantastic the work that the Braillist Foundation is doing. I certainly don't see it in competition in any way with UCAF. It's an addition and we need all these different approaches that are adding something to the mix, don't we? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, the, the, I think standards are a great thing. Uh, I really do. But also, I think sometimes you can get so bogged down in standards, you can get so bogged down in saying, well, hang on, this paragraph hasn't been lined up as, as a three to one, or, you know, we need to take a new page here, and we haven't, and all of this sort of thing. And, and this is very valuable. And if you're transcribing, you know, professional documents mm -hmm. or documents mm -hmm. for the school system or anything like that, you know, this is extremely important. And, um, you know, I, I like Braille transcribed to a high standard uh, but the the flip side of that is that it can scare people off and you can look at you know you can look at braille and go goodness me this is hard there's so many rules and actually one of the things you want to do at the braille list is to say yes there are rules and the rules exist for a good reason and you should follow them but actually if all you want to do is write some labels around your house you know it doesn't actually matter whether you follow the standards or not because actually the only person who's going to read those labels is you Absolutely right. And those sort of, sort of things have been going on for really many, many years, haven't they? You, you, you invent your own system for your, you know, what it, whatever it is you might be uh, having a label for at home and you do it in your particular way. And that's right. I, I mean, yeah, and that, that's absolutely, absolutely fine. There's a difference uh, between, as you say, the professional side of thing. But the most important thing is that one is encouraging the use of Braille by individuals and that they don't feel, oh, well, I'm, I mustn't do this because it might be wrong because the standard tells me I shouldn't do it this way. You just do mm. it that way. Yes. So that's, so that's, and how do you see the future of the Braille list going? Um, <laughs> how does anybody in the Braille list see the future of yeah. the Braille lists going? Um, we sort of ended up where we are by accident. We're very proud of where we've ended up by accident. It feels like I've said it by accident quite a lot in this conversation. Uh, but it's true, you know, if it wasn't for the coronavirus pandemic, the Braille lists would be in a very different place to where mm. it is now. Yes, of course. Um, and I think we sort of need to go back to basics at some point because um, what we're doing is great, but I'm sure there's a lot more that we could be doing if we would let ourselves sort of think outside the box a bit. I think one of the things that I really see happening over the next few years uh, is is a return to more in-person events. We ran an event that was very successful in Bristol last April, um, which was sort of a bring and share event. You know, people brought their Braille displays along and uh, we could all look at each other's braille technology and decide you know whether theirs was better than ours or not you know but it was a great way of just you know getting familiar with what was actually on 
the market because we all know our own braille displays but we don't actually know what the competition is doing a lot of the time because it's so expensive and it's so difficult to actually get to them you know yeah. you can go to site village but site village is often so busy that you can't often find the people that you want to talk to and find the equipment that you actually want to see uh, so and spend and spend time with the piece of equipment <clears throat> just to get get an idea of what it what it really does so that you can evaluate that for yourself I think that's right. Yes. Um, yeah, you can spend five minutes at it at Site Village. But yeah, certainly one of the, the perks of the Bristol event was you could spend 15, 20 minutes with a piece of technology if you wanted to. So we want to do more of that, um, bringing the community together, um, getting people talking about Braille, which which actually we're doing very well uh, through the online stuff. But you can do even better through face to face, because if people are talking positively about Braille, then that has a knock on effect when they're talking to other people about Braille. It, it stops being sort of old and dusty and starts it, being relevant it, again. Absolutely. And it's the journey that never ends because there's always more to do a conversation you have with somebody and that can lead to a whole lot of other things that follow on. That's right. And I mean, that that's, you know, borne out with the relationship we have with Bristol Braille. And we're, we're very proud of that relationship. It would be nice to have some relationships elsewhere in the sector. And so we're exploring, you know, ways in which we can uh, build those. You, you, there's an event going on tomorrow uh, with uh, sight and sound technology, for example. And uh, so it's good to build out those relationships with other partners as well. Indeed. So. So turning to you, Kath, could you tell us a bit about the work of the Braille groups which you lead? Yes, um, it's very wide ranging. Uh, currently, there are two Braille groups. There is the Braille coding group. Uh, the Braille coding group actually has a fairly straightforward remit. Um, the coding group's job is to look at and analyze and, and work on the, the Braille rules. Uh, so the rules of UEB predominantly. And uh, so we're looking at, for example, uh, should we have a new sign for this print symbol that we didn't know about before? Um, OK, we've we've got a word that could be contracted in multiple ways. Uh, which way is the best way to contract that rules? Which one to contract that word? You know, what's what's closest to the, the sense of the rules there? Um, there's a big project going on at the moment. We have grade one indicators in UEB um, which are to do with, you know, if, if the letter J stands for the word just if you actually want a letter J, how do you show that? And you show it with grade one indicators. It's a bit more technical than that, but there are various grade one indicators that mean different things and how do you apply them and when do you apply them and which one do you use? And so there's a big project going on about that. And, and we do this uh, in conjunction with something called the International Council on English Braille, of which UCAF is a member. Um, so we will meet as a coding group and we will either put a proposal together or we will look at a proposal from another country uh, through ICEB and we'll decide uh, if it's if it's us making the proposal, we'll we'll put it in a form of words that other countries can can vote on. Uh, if we're voting on it, obviously, we'll have a vote and we'll decide which way we're going to vote and we'll we'll post that up to ICEB. And we work very closely with, for example, the Braille Authority of North America, um, the, the Braille Authority of New Zealand, uh, our Terra Trust, um, our closest uh, neighbours are actually in Bath, the Irish National Braille and Alternative Formats Organisation, and we work very closely with them uh, and, and many others as well, Braille Literacy Canada, and uh, the, the list goes on. Um, I know that UCAF has had work in the past with the Roundtable, which is the Australian Braille Authority or, or, or includes the Australian Braille Authority. Um, the, the Braille General Group has a more general remit, as the name would suggest. Um, essentially, the Braille General Group does everything that the Braille Coding Group doesn't do. Um, so it's looking at, um, for example, uh, the the impact of Braille. Um, are users still reading Braille? If they're not, then why are they not? Is there a standards issue here? Um, you know, to do with formatting Braille. So one of the things we looked at recently was typeform indicators and not so much how do we apply typeform indicators because that's a coding group issue, but are typeform indicators like bold and italics and underline, are they getting in the way of people's enjoyment of Braille? And we've determined that they, they sort of are, but transcribers have already picked up on this and they're not using them as much. Uh, so therefore that sort of mitigated that. Um, but, you know, all of that sort of thing, really, Braille promotion, um, working with other braille uh, stakeholders so you know working with uh, transcribers and producers to make sure that braille is of a very high quality 
and uh, and and between the the two groups uh, that sort of covers basically every element of UCAF standards when it comes to braille there's quite a lot going on there um matthew as i mentioned earlier in your spare time you sing in the choir of coventry cathedral could you tell us about how braille helps you in that particular situation yes it's funny when i look back at it um i was a singer as a child i actually sang in the city of birmingham symphony youth chorus uh, which is very exciting and um Indeed. i'm going to be are going to be doing some more singing with the CBSC hopefully in the summer, which will be quite exciting. Um, but when I sang with CBSYC, um, they didn't have any way of transcribing Braille. Uh, and so actually, I used to do a lot of my own transcription, even back then at the age of sort of 12 or 13 or something, you know, they would email me some words quite often. And words was was all I really needed at that point. And, uh, and I would uh, put them through a braille embosser and, and braille would come out the other side and i stopped singing when my voice broke because i got very upset because i couldn't sing the descants at christmas <laughs> and i really just didn't think my voice was worth listening to when it couldn't sing descants and so i stopped and um went all the way through college really and university without doing any singing and um i i got my braille embosser back out and uh, I thought, yes, what did I ever use this for? Oh, yes, I used it for singing. And about the same time, um, I fancied a girl uh, and we we actually went out for two or three years. But um, she was a singer and got me back into singing. And uh, we did a, an opera called Noah's Flood, which is a Benjamin Britten opera really yes. designed for school children. Um, but the, the church that that Rachel went to was doing it as a as a community sort of exercise. And um, and so I got Noah's flood out and I got my embosser out and I transcribed all the words. And I thought, yes, aren't I great? Because I've got all this sorted out. And and anyway, this was all going very well. And um, I then started to realize that actually everybody else was sight reading and I couldn't. Uh, and so I'd been introduced to Braille music at primary school, but grudgingly uh, from both sides. Actually, I didn't really want to learn it and they didn't really want to teach it. Um, but I got my old Braille music manuals back out and I thought, yes, actually, there's you know, Braille music could be useful, particularly as a singer, because it's, I think, probably the only thing where you can actually um, read the notes and sing them at the same time. Anything else, really, unless you're playing right hand on a piano and reading with the left hand, which you could do. But, you know, you couldn't read both hands and play both hands at the same time. There are um, there are one, there are one or two <clears throat> if you've got single handed instruments that um you know where you can where you can do that obviously read the braille with one hand and play with the other but but you're absolutely right i mean si singing is a real prime candidate for being able to get close to sight reading isn't it yes so i i got used to the idea of that and started to look around you know for for braille music and um realized it it you know, mostly came in quite big uh, bulky things you know big bulky books and i thought no i don't want that so i started you know creating um, single sheets again using the Braille embosser and then gradually got to a point where repertoire was good and reading was 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 passable I mean actually my Braille music reading still isn't great but um, but you know it, it's at a point where it's usable and um, I thought right well the Cathedral Choir are are looking uh, for people to join the voluntary choir actually at the time and Rachel was in the voluntary choir and gave me a good reference and I passed the audition uh, and so I started singing there and I coped and then a vacancy came up for um, what in Coventry we call choral clerks. In a lot of cathedrals, they'll call them lay clerks or songmen or vicar's mm. choral or, or what yes. have you. But in Coventry, yes. we called them choral clerks. And a vacancy came up for a tenor choral clerk. And obviously by then I had a good relationship with the cathedral. And I said, look, I don't know if this will work, but how about it? And they said, well, we don't know if it'll work either, but you've got a good voice and a good sense of musicianship. So how about it? And um, and then COVID happened and we got a new director of music. And when I had a chat with new director of music and said, technically, I'm still on probation. So what do you want to do about it? She said, uh, oh, I'll, I'll bring your probation to an end straight away and you can stay on. You've got the job. Uh, so so I've been there ever since. And, and uh, enjoying sing, singing a, a variety of repertoire. So do, do you use Braille much in that respect? Do you make um Oh, gosh, all the time. 
Yeah. Yes, I realise I sort of haven't answered the question, have I? Yeah, all no. the time, all the time, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, you, I wouldn't, might. I wouldn't be without it in in something like this. I mean, if you take a morning service, you've got uh, four hymns mm. and a a setting of the mass or the Eucharist, yeah. Yeah. and you've got an anthem. That's right. Now the 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 hymns. Actually, I don't tend to read the hymns, the the the, the music for the hymns very much. Uh, it's it's just the text that I need really for those because you know it's a fairly simple tune. You can yeah. memorize that. So mm. I have the text, but I do need the text not least because of course uh, things are being um, gender neutralized. You know, like songs of sinful man. You can't sing songs of sinful man anymore. You know, um, I can't remember what they what they say, but they change it to you know something involving human or all or or us or or something you know um so all of this sort of happens see even if i thought i could remember the words i'd want to read them from the service sheet just to make sure i've got the right ones to make sure they haven't missed any verses out to shorten the hymn a little bit Mm -hmm. um the 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 settings um i do have the music for some of those it is extremely useful um more as an aid memoir at this point because actually it's in repertoire we've got about 20 settings that are in repertoire and they just come round uh, you know every so often and when you've sung it sort of five or six times you sort of yeah. you know what you're doing really you're not yes. really reading it at that point but occasionally something will happen and you'll think oh um the person next to me is singing something that i don't remember um perhaps i ought to check whether they've got it wrong or whether i've got it wrong uh, and so it's it's very useful for that and and the same sort of setup at even song actually a lot of even song is uh, is from memory now um we will sing a setting of the responses a setting of the canticles um a setting of an anthem maybe uh, and a hymn and a psalm um again the psalm really i'm just looking at the text because the chant you can memorize the canticles well they come round you know again same as the settings really in the responses so a lot of that's just from memory but yes the anthem and the hymn and sometimes you don't get a, an awful lot of time to prepare this stuff especially if it's a new commission or something like that you may be given you know four or five weeks if you're very lucky and sometimes you've been given one or two weeks and and then it's a combination of reading and listening to the person next to you and making a decision you know about well has this person got it right you know um perhaps i ought to check that in the braille um you know having a good sense of where you are before you start so that you 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 know, so you don't know what you're doing. And so, yes, no, without Braille, I don't think I'd be able to manage it at all. Yes, well, that's, it's good that you can make full use of Braille in that settings. And it, as you say, however large or small, there, there, there is a varied repertoire. But as you say, you've, uh, over time, you've, you know, with the uh, uh, various settings being used, you, as you say, you get used to them, you, you know them better, and uh, so you can take care of those things. Just finally, Matthew, just switching back to a couple of things, um, do you have any thoughts as to where Braille technology might be taking us in, in the future and how the landscape might change i mean for instance if there are more multi-line displays for instance just mentioning one thing but do you have any views on that Mm, there's a big conversation about multi-line displays now isn't there i mean commute that we mentioned earlier has gone from being a prototype to actually being on the market uh, absolutely uh, which is marvelous um aph and humanware are working on the dynamic tactile device uh, i'm looking forward to where that's going actually because that um will be able to do in theory anyway both multi-line braille and tactile graphics on the same device uh, don't mm. ask me how i haven't seen one yet but they they seem pretty confident it can do it and if anybody could pull it off it would be aph and humanware um there are technical considerations to do with that you know are are the current braille file formats up to doing that and we think they're probably not so one of the other things actually that we're doing uh in ucaf is is being involved in a project to uh re-standardize braille file formats and make a new braille file format that can embed tactile graphics and multi-line braille you know in in the same file and be reflowable so if you've got it on a 20 cell display it will read just as well as on a 40 cell display and that's called uh, ebrf Uh, that's its working title anyway um and so there's there's a whole load of things going on and i I think it's a very exciting time for braille um my worry about a lot of the things that are coming out at the moment 
uh, you know, if it costs two and a half grand for a 40 cell single line display, how much is it going to cost for a nine lines of 40 cell display? And and if it's going to be cheaper, what are the compromises? You know, um, Orbit Research have come out or are coming out with the Orbit Slate um, and they've got a three lines of 40, which I think is about the same price as a one line of 40 at the moment, but obviously is is a bit noisier than the normal Braille displays that we get, you know. Uh, Canute has the same problem. It's it's a bit noisier and it's only got six dot cells rather than eight dot cells, which is fine for reading text. But if you want to show the placement of the cursor, if you're working with a computer, then it's not quite so fine. Mm. Um, and then how do screen readers interact with multi-line Braille? Um, are you just going to show nine lines of the screen or are you going to fix the top line as the title and the bottom line as the status bar and then just have the lines in the middle update? And are you going to put some effort into making sure that when there's a table, the top line always has the table headers and all of that sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot of development that needs to go on to make it cheap and or, well, or, or cheaper, more affordable and to actually make it useful. Uh, but it will be really exciting to see where it goes. And And also if there's some commonality about how this is processed rather than somebody coming up with one way of doing something and another um, device being entirely different so there might be some I mean obviously that obviously there may well be differences but to try and keep some unity somewhere along the line I think could be useful but it as you say it's a very interesting time and uh, we'll see what happens so um Finally, out of interest, Matthew, do you know if there are similar organisations to the Brailleist Foundation in other countries? We don't think there are any organisations quite like the Brailleists. Um, there are some that come very close. We've actually just met somebody from New Zealand who is setting up something called the Tactile and Technology Literacy Centre, and they go by double TLC. Um, they're a fledgling organisation. We're working in partnership uh, with them, actually. Uh, we, we launched a Braille for Beginners course not so long ago, and they'd quite like to roll that out in New Zealand. So we're working with them on that and we'll we'll work with them on other things down the line, I'm sure. Um, there's also an organisation in America uh, called the Braille Revival League, uh, which, of course, abbreviates <laughs> to BRL, which is uh, the, the contraction for Braille. So that's very good. Uh, but they are an affiliate of the American Council of the Blind. They're a special interest affiliate of ACB. Um, so obviously there's, there's politics there. What if you're an NFB member and want to join? Um, I don't quite know how that works, but they're doing very similar work. But um, not, not at the same level of um, grassrootsness and independence and... Yeah, I, I think there's, there's something very special about the Brailleists and how it's grown and how it's developing that other countries we, we might see in the future, but I don't think we're there yet. Yes, it's an interesting journey with all these things. Matthew, I should like to thank you most sincerely for your involvement, for your comments, your your answers, your uh, being so informative about Braille. And I think if anybody doubted that you have a passion for Braille. I think that will have been put well aside by now <laughs> and delighted we are that is the case. I'd also like to thank Sarah behind the scenes for her help with this webinar. Our next webinar will be in March, which is the one we had to postpone from November with Victoria Ward from New College Worcester. So again, thank you, Matthew. And until next time, from all of us, goodbye.